Good evening, and welcome to our Bible study. I'm Pastor A.D. Pastor of True Vine, NBC here in Houston, Texas, and I thank you so much for joining us for our Bible study. And before I get started, I just want to let you know, if you have yet to subscribe to this channel, please subscribe to this channel. Just hit the subscribe button and give us a like up and share this channel. And also, if you check our description down below, you would see all our information. If you want to join the church, our email is there. Just send us an email about joining and any questions. Send in the email also. And we also have a cash out. We have a Zelle account. Different ways you can pay if you want to send uh, a love offering or anything, please do. We love you so much, but everything is down in the description. Please check the description down below. And, and today I want to talk about in our Bible study, the role of a woman, part four. Very important, very important that we really um, let this word seek in and really receive the word of God. I'm not giving you my opinion. We all have opinions, right? I'm not giving you that. No, we're going to look at the word of God and we're going to let scripture interpret scripture. So it's very important that we take heed to the word of God and let the Holy Spirit have his way in our lives. And also, we must put away all of our attitudes, put away any type of uh, tension you may have against this subject about the role of a woman, because we're talking about should a woman be a senior pastor or a pastor of a church or not, or should she not? And obviously the Bible says, no, she should not. Because all it gives us is the overseer of the church. That overseer of the church is the man. It's not the woman. And so that's very important that you receive that. And if you are in some kind of way in fellowship or in some kind of way, maybe you go to a church or maybe you have a church and you're the pastor of the church. And if it is not just women in your congregation and children in your congregation. And when there's man within your, and a, a man or men within your congregation, then you are are stepping on dangerous grounds because a woman cannot have authority over a man. And that's what the Bible talks about. That's God's roles. God set up a role, an order in his church and at home, in the homes, in the house of Christians and believers in Christ, the saints. And we have order. We have order. And that order is first created. Adam was created. Then we have Eve. Okay. So that's the order, a man and a woman. And so a woman was created to be our helpmate. And so very important that you know the order within the church. So Paul comes and sets up this particular church in Ephesus. I'm going to give you outlook. Now, then, back then, in the first century and second century church, they had church within people houses. They didn't have a fellowship hall like we do or some type of big building or a small building, a tent. No, they set church up within people homes. And within that home in Ephesus, that was an issue that arose because of the false prophets that came within this church, which you'll hear here in the overview. And, and, and so one of those false prophets was a woman and she was taking charge of that church. And that's why Timothy came in and put her out the church and put a few more of those uh, false prophets out the church because, and then began to bring decorum order within that church. So it's very important that we have order, have structure within the church. Um, and we must, <laughs> this is the word of God and we cannot use the word of God as a buffet and pick what we want to pick and choose what we want to choose out of it. No, either we receive all the word of God or none of the word of God, but this is the word of God. This is God's word spoken. Um, if you've ever been to seminary, you were taught first off and they beat this into you that the word of God right here, this is God's word. God's word is immutable. That means it never changes. God's word never changes. It, it doesn't bring, it's not nothing new and nothing like that. No, this is God's spoken word. There's no more revelation needed. Okay, this is no more revelation needed. This is God's full spoken word. After now, God doesn't speak. We have the Holy Spirit that speaks. He said, I'll leave you a comforter. The Holy Spirit speaks. So this is God speaking right here. God's word, right? The Holy word. And it's complete. It doesn't need any added revelation. And anything added, it doesn't need. Okay, you can keep it to yourself. It doesn't need your opinions. It doesn't need how you feel. God doesn't care about that, about how you're feeling as far as um, if his word is going against you or not or what you want to do. And what I'm saying is, if we just stay with God's word and don't go away from God's word, we want to stay with God's word because this word is not it. what we're talking about today. First Timothy, the second chapter, verses 11 through 15 is not 
talking about. It is not just talking about a cultural thing. It has something to do with a little cultural, but it's not talking about all of cultural. No, Paul is setting up the church and how the church should be ran, the order of the church, okay, the ranking of the church. And he sets that up. And we're going to see that next week within chapter three. He's, he's what he's doing. He's building up to that part where he brings forth the overseer in first Timothy chapter three, verse one, he's going to present that to the church. Next time we're going to present it. We're going to look at it. And it said, uh, and it's going to talk about the bishop, the overseer, the head of the church, which means pastor. So we're going to go on and we're going to talk about that next time. But keep that in mind, church, before we start, that you understand the word of God, that, that God never changes. He's the same God yesterday, today, and forevermore. So that means he's the same God during Paul time, and he's the same God now. And he's not going to do anything new. And also, keep in mind that Paul is not a male chauv chauvinist. He's not that. He's not a chauvinist. He's not dogging women out. No, he's not. I'm not dogging women out. No, we're not. And so, um, so it's just very important that we learn to order the decorum within the church as believers in Christ. So it's up to you to receive the word, the word of God. So let's get started. I'm going to pray and then I have an overview. Lord, we thank you once again, Lord. We thank you for everything, Lord. Continue to share your word, Lord, your holy word, Lord. Please, Lord, we want to learn your word. We want to breathe your word. We want to live your word, Lord. Help the women to learn their role within the church, dear God, for they're special to you. They're special to us, Lord. And help them, dear God, in the name of Jesus. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' holy name. Amen, 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 amen. The role of a woman, part four. The role of a woman, part four. Now, to introduce our study today, let me remind you of the fears of the Apostle Paul had come to pass in the church of Ephesus. This is the church that he's in right now, Ephesus. If you will remember in Acts 20, when Paul gathered together the Ephesians elders at um, Maltus in verse 17 of the chapter, and then went on to discuss with them the priorities of the ministry, he concluded the discussion with a warning section. That warning section expressed his deepest fears for that this particular congregation. Let me read it to you, just a few verses uh, out of Acts 20 so that you'll be familiar, familiar with this statement. Excuse me. Beginning in verse 29, he says, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves shall enter in among and spark the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after me. Therefore, watch and remember that for the space of three years, I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and the word of his um, grace, which is able to build you up and give an inheritance among all men who are sanctified. Now, in that, Paul expresses this great fear that false teachers would come into this particular church, very important, come into this particular church and would rise within this church as well as come in from the outside. And that's what's going on within this particular church. False prophets, again, is coming to attack Paul in the church that he had begun. Okay, so the church Ephesus had great beginnings, marvelous beginnings. It was born out of a great revival. It was born out of great, out of paganism with a clarity of purpose okay a very important purpose an intent that is without a surpassing experience in the book of acts and again this is a very poor church and yet paul knew inevitably no matter how good the beginning no matter how effective his own three-year ministry in that city it was inevitable that the enemy would begin to attack this church by bringing in false teachers, unholy leaders, to bring it down from its place of effectiveness from God, and to be sure, Paul's worst fears did come to pass. So by the time he he has finished his first imprisonment in Rome, having been released from that, he met Timothy in Ephesus, and when they met there, they found that indeed that the church of his heart, that church which had taken on so many years of his rather brief ministry, that church which he loved so deeply and and for which he no doubt prayed regularly, had fallen prey to false teachers and those who advocated a godless living pattern. And see, before he, on his first missionary journey, in his second, what he did, what Paul did, he left um, Priscilla and Aquila to uh, manage this church, to really manage this church and help out with this church. And then something went 
uh, what we just read anyway, a raise, something just happened. And here comes the false teachers. They're coming in and they begin to sift the people like wheat. Now, Timothy, he sends Timothy now, Timothy evangelist. He sent him um, to really get this church in order. He's setting up the church. Again, Paul is setting up the church, the role of the church. And he must send Timothy into this place to get things straight and to run out the false teachers, to kick them out the church. Now, Timothy met there. He put out of the church two of the most prominent leaders. There it is in verse 20 of chapter one, Hermanius and Alexander. It says of them whom I have delivered unto Satan, indicating that he himself dealt with them. Now, the primary problem in this church at Ephesus was false leadership. There it is. False leadership. They had a problem with the leadership. Now, I believe what's going on within this church as far as false leadership is men and women within this church are trying to lead this church. And the beginning of chapter three and running all the way to the end of the epistle, really there is a preoccupation with these false leaders. Some chapters are more totally devoted than others, but the theme that is woven through uh, three through six of first Timothy chapters it, it is the theme of dealing with false leaders, false leaders. That's a problem. When you have a false leader within the church, you're going to find a lot of problems within the congregation. So the book then is polemic and, and, and it is a, uh, it is, it is against the false leaders who have arisen in the church of Ephesus. Now, these false leaders brought with them a lot of baggage, a lot of baggage. Their ungodliness manifested itself in many ways. And that's the thing. Whenever the enemy comes into the church, if you let it, it will manifest within the church. It, it, that attitude, whatever it's bringing, the lies, whatever, the treachery, whatever it's bringing within the church is going to spread. It's going to spread, spread among the members. And it's very important that you put that out of the church. One of the ways in which their false leadership brought problems to the church was in the matter of the woman's role. You see that because they already knew. Paul had already stressed this point that the role of a man and the role of a woman and what it was. It is apparent that in this church, there were certain women who were des desirous, okay, of taking the place of official teacher, of the leader in the church and, and usurping authority. They wanted that authority over the men and they wanted to lead this church. And that was one of the problems, no doubt, under the false leadership of those who had risen to the role of pastor or elder and were doing all they could to undermine the word of God. And that's the thing. A lot of us want to use the word of God like it's a buffet. OK, we want to pick what we want out of the book, out of the word of God. We want to pick what fits us. We, we ignore everything else. We want to pick or we'll look at it and, and do our best to misunderstand that particular verse, which we clearly can understand what it's saying. However, that's what we want to do. We want to pick what we want, pick and choose what we want out of the, out of the Bible. And that's not how it works. The word of God doesn't work like that. Either you receive all of it or don't receive none of it. And that's God's word. And so that was one of the problems, no doubt, under the false leadership of those who had risen to the role of pastor and elder who were doing all they could to undermine the word of God. And it may well be. Uh, we don't know for certain that some of these false teachers themselves would not only have advocated a non-biblical role of the woman, but it is possible that some of them may have been women themselves. And that's why qualifications for an elder given in chapter three are distinctively given as male qualifications, such as a, a, a one woman man, the man who knows how to manage his own household. And we're going to get to get to that next week. I will read it this week today. However, we will study that next week on next week when it talks about the overseer of the house, the overseer of the church. And we're going to see that how he must be a one woman man. It didn't say nothing about a woman being an overseer. It talks about a man being a pastor, not a woman. And we're going to look at that. It is apparent. It is apparent and it is vital. And it will behoove us to understand that because it's very important that we do. If not, we can't just do what we want to do with God's word. We can't mismanage it. We can't take it and just say, oh, Maybe that was just for that time. No, it wasn't just for this culture. It wasn't just for this time. It's for now and forever. This is how it should be. And so we're going we're gonna to understand this within this study. This is what God is saying. And he's setting up the church. He's using Paul 
And he's using Timothy to set up this particular church. And he used Titus also to set up the church. And so we're going we're gonna to look at this. We want to understand. We want to understand what's really going on within these churches. And there was a problem within the church. You had a false prophet within the church, false prophets. And one of them was a woman who wanted to lead the church. And so uh, that there were women seeking to be teachers in the church and to observe authority over the man. And with that issue, Paul must deal in specifics before he gets into dealing with the false leaders themselves in chapter three. So from verse nine to verse 15, Paul gives us six elements of this very important instruction regarding the role of women in the church. And we already went over um, four or five of them already in, in past Bible studies. So today we'll find out the next one. And so here we go. Let's look at it. Let's look at, let's read verses 11 and 12 first. Let a woman learn in silence with all submission. Verse 12. And I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. And so, of course, that was, that was that issue. You have the false teachers in there, and that's who Timothy had to put out the church. These false teachers, this woman, one of them was a woman who wanted to observe her authority over everybody, over the men. And so now that takes us fourthly to their role. And, and this is really the heart of what we're looking at now. The role of a woman then is given in verses 11 and 12. We're taking specifically not um, now, uh, I would say now about their function in the church, okay? Their function in the church. And the first thing we noted in verse 11 is that the apostle says, let the women learn. Let the women learn. Remember, we talked a little bit about that last time. I don't want to go deep into discussion about it, but today we will. Let the women learn. We realize that from the Jewish culture and from the pagan culture, women were put on a second class level. Yes, they were. And their status was that of one who perhaps was on the level of a slave. In some cases, even on the level of a beast of burden. OK, and there was a little concern in the minds of the Jews of that day, whether women learned anything or not, or whether they were educated or not, since they were really not a part of the significant education of the populace. OK, so that was to be the men and the men were responsible for passing on the truth. OK, because the men should know they study, they've been in school for it. And so they should know now. Now we got to look at also, we got to examine this because uh, let me give you a picture, a quick picture of what's going on. Okay, quick picture. Now, then in the church, the church then in the first century church, second century church, they had churches, they had the church, they had church within the house, someone's house. They utilized someone's house in order to have church. Okay, they didn't have a building. Okay, they had someone's house. They would see who house they're going to have it on this week, see who house they're going to have it on this day, and they would utilize someone's house to have church. And so at times it was in tight spots, okay, very um, enclosed spots. And so um, what would happen, you would have one would prophesy, one, and the next one would prophesy, one would speak in tongue. You would have the interpreter if someone were to speak in tongue. We're going to see that in a minute, and we're going to get deep in detail about that. But it was order within the church, very orderly. It was, it was decorum within the church. And so we must remember that within the church, we must have decorum. We must have that order within the church. And so that was what was going on in this particular church. At this time, however, the false teachers was in the house, okay? False teachers was in this particular house at Ephesus, where the location where they literally had and mainly had church um, at. And so at this particular location, uh, you had those false um, prophets in this place. And, then, and of course, Timothy comes in, put them out. And so you had um, women thinking, which the false teachers made them think that, that they had had this type of authority now that they can observe their authority. They have authority over their husbands. They got authority over, over the men within the church. And then you got to also realize that after the fact of, of Timothy telling them, um, repeating Paul, reiterating Paul to, uh, ask your husbands when you get home, not every woman in that place were married. Okay. So who were they at? So that's, you got to ask yourself. Okay. You had single women in there too, within the house. So who, who <laughs> I mean, they don't have a husband to ask. So, um, all they know is to keep silent because Timothy was trying to shut that thing. He was shutting it down. Like Paul instructed him to do shut that place down, shut it down.
kick them out, shut it down, get things back in order, get the church back in order. It must have order. And the roles, very important, was really demoralized. And so what Timothy had to come down to do, and re, he had to come back and restructure, restructure this particular church of Ephesus. And that what was going on within that church. So it's just like today. We have false prophets everywhere, right? We see them all the time. A lot of times on TV, we see them. And, um, and they say whatever, tell you whatever, just to build their congregation, just to build their, their monies, on and on, just to be lucrative in any kind of way, shape, form, fashion, various ways. They could be lucrative, but they will lie just to do that. And we know many of them. I don't have to call any names. However, we know that. However, what would happen was, and when you had apostles, we don't have any apostles today, not like this is the apostles of the first century. So we don't have that. The apostle is someone who's seen God face to face. Okay. And the apostle would come in to the church and they would put structure within the church. They would organize the church. Okay. They would reframe the church. If the church was messed up in any kind of way, they would put structure and order and decorum within that church. And so... It was immaterial to them whether the women showed up at the synagogue, whether they came to the feast and festivals. That was inconsequential. Now, in inconsequential. Now, the same was true in Greek culture where women were not thought to be worthy in many cases of their learning process. Okay, so we must understand that, that Paul says, let the women learn a very affirmative statement affirming for us the equality of spiritual privilege, the equality of spiritual rights, blessings and promises, men and women. And, and so let them learn. And so he was advocating, he was advocating for them to learn, let them learn, because again, majority of the men during that time in Christianity were already educated. They were already educated. And um, and so he wanted the women to learn and so they could understand the word of God. And that's why a lot of them begin to speak out, even in this church, not only this church, but then you have the church of the Corinthians, which we'll look at in a little bit, the church of Corinth and um, how the women there would speak out because of the false prophets that came in again to really tear down and denigrate Paul's name within that church. And so they were misled. They were misled by, by false prophets. So let's look at a few verses because I want to I want to show you that it's OK for women to preach and teach. I want to show you that. Otherwise, it'll be a contradiction from Paul. So let's, let's look at Acts chapter two, verse 18. Acts chapter two, verse 18. And this is the reiteration of Joel's prophecy. And all they doing all in the book of Acts, Luke is going to reiterate, reiterate exactly what Joel said in the Old Testament, in the book of Joel. So in those days, I will pour out my spirit, even on my servants, men and women alike, and they will prophesy. In those days, it's talking about now, really when it's talking about in those days, it's talking about the day of Pentecost that the in the book of Acts that they experienced. That's why it's mentioned again here. That's why I reiterated right now that the Holy Spirit was really poured out unto them. And so men and women alike, and they will prophesy. You see that, right? In Acts chapter two, verse 18. So they let us know men and women will prophesy, right? Speak the word of God. And then we have Acts 18 and 26. When Priscilla and Aquila, and this is a wife and a husband team, Priscilla is the woman, Aquila is the man, heard him preaching boldly in the synagogue, talking about Apollos, they took him aside and explained the way of God even more accurately. And so the woman and man of God, who are ministers, took Apollos, a great man of God, a powerful man of God. Of course, he was he was a babe in Christ at this point in time. He was still on milk, but he was learning to be uh, a great minister of God, the apostle of the churches. And so, um, and so <laughs> they ministered to him. Um, Pris Pris Priscilla and Aquila ministered to him and, and got everything straight with him with the word of God that he would, that he would be able to answer and present the word of God more accurately. And that's what happened. And then we have Acts 21, chapter 21, verse nine, Acts chapter 21, verse nine. It, it talks about how Philip had four unmarried daughters who had the gift of prophecy. 
Philip had four unmarried daughters who had the gift of prophecy. So again, a woman can preach. That's not the problem here. So I just wanted to get that, get that out the way. And but we, I still have some more here. Let's look at some more. Romans 16, 1 through 16. Of course, I'm not going to read all that. Romans chapter 16, verses 1 through 16. At least 10 women went in support of Paul on his ministry journey. And yes, they helped minister. They ministered to other women. And then we have 1 Corinthians 11 and 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 5, where Paul allowed women to pray and prophesy in the church, but they had to have their head covering on. And that's a cultural thing right there with the head covering. They had to have their head covering on. That way, that would show their level, their, their level of um, inferiority, okay, not superiority, if they keep their head covered. And so, and, and so he allowed that. Paul allowed women to pray and prophesy within that church. 11 and 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 5. And then we have 1 Corinthians 14. Now we're going to get a little deeper in our study. 1 Corinthians 14, 26 through 33. And, and, and within these particular chap, um, scriptures I'm about to mention here, within this 14th chapter, there's a lot of footnotes that um, you may want to write down. And, and that's outside of um, women and men preaching and women um, using, having that authority above men. Okay, we're going to talk about tongues too. Okay, so 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 26 through 33. Well, my brothers and sisters, let me sum, let's summarize. When you meet together, when you meet together, brothers and sisters, one will sing, brothers and sisters will sing, another will teach, Another will teach, and to say a man, to say another will teach. Another will tell some special revelation God has given. That's three. And one will speak in tongues. You got that? One will speak in tongues. Not everybody speaking in tongues at the same time. One will speak in tongues. And another will interpret what was said. So whenever you speak in tongues within the church, there must be an interpreter within that church somewhere that's going to interpret what you just said. But everything that is done must strengthen all of you. Now, it's not talking about the tongues that we hear today. Tongues, every time you see tongues within a Bible, in the Greek or Hebrew, it means languages. It's not hushadabaho sakata. It's not that. It's not that, what we hear today. No, it's languages. So it's hola kumostas. That's another language. That is Spanish, right? So it's another language. It's not, it's languages. It's not talking about that type of speaking in tongues that we hear today, which in the Kojic church or the holiness church, even sometimes in the Baptist church, where it's not talking about that or Pentecost. It's not talking about that. Okay. That type of speaking in tongues is talking about languages. That's the Greek and Hebrew languages. Now, 27th verse, no more than two or three should speak in tongues. No more than two or three should speak in tongues. Though when you go to some churches, you hear a lot of people at the same time, a little bit sitting about how to, on and on. No, 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 no. They must speak one at a time. And someone, someone, if they were speaking to, if one person were to speak in tongues, it says must interpret what they say. Someone must interpret it. Someone must tell it, the congregation is nobody know what's going on in the congregation. They're confused and, and tongues are for the unbeliever. And so they are confused within the church and they don't understand what this person is talking about. What are they talking about? There should be an interpreter, interpreter there to interpret of what's going on within this particular church. So what this person is saying, they must be silent in your church meeting and speak in tongues to God privately. Really, when you're speaking in tongues and speaking another language, you must do that privately, one on one with God only. And then the 29th verse says of that 14th chapter, first Corinthians said, let two or three people prophesy and let others evaluate what is said. So. During this particular time, there were prophets within the church, great prophets, Apostle Paul, you had great prophets, um, Peter, on and on. And what they would do, they were uh, they will evaluate whatever the, the, the other prophet is saying, they will evaluate it and they will let them know if they're right or wrong. If they go off track, they will be interrupted very quickly. If they go off track with the word of God and start preaching any type of other gospel other than what's in the book, the word of God, they will correct them right on the spot. And that's, that's again, we have the noble Marines. The noble Marines did the same thing within the church. They were the lay members. However, when they heard the word of God and, and a person preaching the word of God and the person that's preaching 
Um, if they m make a mistake within the word of God, they will correct them. They will stop them and correct them because they studied the word of God that much. And then in the 30th verse, but if someone is prophesying and another person receives a revelation from the Lord, the one who is speaking must stop. That one that is speaking. So understand this also. It's not talking about just one preacher. They had many in there. If one, if one um, received the revelation of God during that time, because remember the, the New Testament wasn't fully written at that time, completed. The Bible wasn't fully completed at that time. And so one would have to stop if God gave another a revelation. And so they can speak. And then the 31st verse says, in this way, all who prophesy will have a term to speak one after the other so that everyone will learn and be encouraged. And you see that decorum they have, the order they have is very important. Be, do things in decency and in order. And they have that order. 32nd verse, very important verse. I love this verse. Remember that people who prophesy are in control. They are in control of their spirit and can take turns. And so when it was, that's why I say in the spirit, you got to learn to snap in and snap out. You got to learn to be in control of the spirit. So when you hear people say they get the falling all over the, 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 um, the benches with the, the um, pews within the church and the chairs and, and doing flips and all that. No, 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 that's not of God. You have control of the spirit. That's the 32nd verse. Say. Remember that people who prophesy are in control of the spirit and can take turns. You have control. You just don't keep running your mouth. No, you have control over the spirit. You can turn it off and you can turn it on. Okay, so for 33rd verse says, for God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. You see that, right? He is not a God of disorder, but of peace. We, have, we serve a very intelligent God. And he does things in decency and in order. And as in all the meetings of God's holy people. And so we must we must remember that and receive that in the word of God. And then we have 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 39 through 40. So, my dear brothers and sisters, be eager, be eager to prophesy, to preach the word of God. And do not, do not forbid speaking in tongues. We don't forbid speaking in tongues. If you know another language, you can speak it. You can speak the languages of God. You can speak because there's several various uh, influx of dialects that we can use, that we can utilize if you know how to speak in those dialects, okay? And you can do that. 40th verse, but be sure that everything is done properly and in order, in decency and in order. Make sure it's done in an orderly form, orderly fashion. So we must remember that, that church, that the way God has set up the church, that everything is done in order. Everything, there's nothing should be out of place. And we're, we don't move by tradition. No, we move by the Holy Ghost. And so the Holy Spirit instructs different things in different ways within the ceremony. Okay. And so we must understand that and really take heed to that. And really realize that our gifts can be utilized within the church, but it's a certain way that it must be utilized. But understand within that passage, it's talking about prophesying, and it said it, it, is, it didn't specify men or women, okay? It said both. It was speaking of both, men and women. It didn't just say men, okay? It said men and women prophesy. If anybody received uh, revelation, anybody, it didn't say a man or woman, it, or just men, it just said it's anybody. If a child receives, they can speak. So it's very important that we that we really receive that as the word of God. And then we have Galatians chapter three, verse 28. Now, this particular <laughs> book, this particular chapter within this book, in this verse is very. <laughs> it's one of the arguments, I would say, that women use women pastors try to use to um, convey or to take place or to. Um, to say, to convey that they have authority also to be a pastor, since we're equal in spirit. So here it is, chapter 3, verse 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek, okay, two different cultures. There is neither slave nor free, okay. There is no male and female, for you all are one in Jesus Christ. Now, did that say anything about authority? No, it did not. It did not say anything about authority. Yes, we are equal in the spirit, but it doesn't say anything about roles. It didn't say anything about ranking. You know, it's just like the military. If you're a military, if you're in the military, you have the general, right? And then below that, you have other rankings. 
So the other rankings cannot outdo a general. No, there's rankings. There's there's roles within the church that that God has given that we must abide by. And within this particular chapter, in this particular verse, you don't see anything about authority. Yes, we're equal in the spirit, and that's why I'm. There's some women that can out preach a man any day. Okay, we're not saying that. That's not the topic. That's not the premise. That's not the premise. And that could be your own conjecture. That can be your own opinion. It doesn't matter. We're not talking about that. We're not talking about who can out preach who, who can out study who, who can out teach you. That's not what we're talking about. This is not a competitive thing. This is the word of God and the word of God must be preached. And, and there is a role that God has set within the household and within the church. And that role is for man to be the superiority within that particular um, junction. And so we must understand that. We must take heed to that God's word. We cannot override God. And that's what we want to do. We want to override God. We want to override his thing because it don't fit our feminist state because a lot of us have feminist ways. We, we keep that feminist, uh, that feminism going on that happened years ago. And we keep that and, we, and they have brought that within the church. And so equality for women as men they try to bring it within the church, and you can't do that. We can't mix that within the church. We go by the Bible, the Word of God. We don't go about go by um, the rights and all that. We don't go by that. We go by the Word of God within the church and at home, and then that's it. Now, I don't run your house. I can't run your house, so whatever goes on in your house goes in your house. However, the Word of God says that a man must run his house, and a, a man must run the, the house of God. That's both. That's two things he must run. And so verses 13 and 15, let's look at that because right now we understand already we have, we have, I hope we have understanding and I hope we agree that it's okay for women to prophesy. Okay. It's okay for women to preach the word of God. We, we got that. That's understand. We got that. We understand that, right? We already went over that. So let's look at verses 13 through 15 of first Timothy chapter two. For those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a good standing and great boldness in the faith, which is in Christ. Oh, I'm sorry. Wrong one. My fan and turn the page. I'm sorry. Let's start over. So here we are. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. See, there it is. Adam, he, he's Paul is setting up the order. He's telling Timothy, Timothy set up the order, start from the very beginning. And this is what Paul would do. Paul would do this. Um a lot whenever trying to convince someone about the word of God. Um, he would start with, for Adam first, he would start at the very beginning. Adam was formed first, then Eve. And I talked about that earlier. And then 14 verse said, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. Now, now we're not saying, I'm not saying the Bible, not saying that women are more gullible than men. We're not saying that now. That's not what the Bible is saying. It's just giving you a clear cut statement, a, a fact that we know what happened in, act, in Genesis and that act. What happened? Eve fell first. She fell and she caused the man to fail because Adam forgot his place, his role. He forgot his position. And, and, he, and every man needs to remember their position at home and at the church. That's what happened. He failed and they fell into transgression. 15 verse, nevertheless, she will be saved in her childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with self-control. So again, Paul is setting up order within the church. So in the church, God does God assigns, he assigns and he has designed different roles to men and women. This is a result of the way mankind was created and the way in which sin entered the world. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. God, through the apostle Paul, restricts women from serving in roles of that authority, spiritual authority over man. Okay, because whenever you have the Bible, you have authority. Whenever you grab this Bible and begin to preach among the people, you have that type of authority. You have great authority. You have authority over men. Um, this precludes women from serving as pastors over men, since pastoring definitely includes preaching, teaching publicly, and exercising spiritual authority. So you can't exercise that type of authority as a senior pastor, as a pastor of a church. Women, you cannot. That's, that, that particular role, that specific role is for a man, man only. 
And there are many objections to this view of women in pastoral ministry. A common one is that Paul restricts women from teaching because in the first century, women were typically uneducated. Remember, we talked about that. However, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 through 14 um, nowhere mentions educational status. So that's out the equation, right? If education were a qualification for ministry, then the majority of Jesus' disciples would not have been qualified. A second, because Peter did not have an education. Peter couldn't even hardly read. And a second common objection is that Paul only restricted the women of Ephesus from teaching men. First Timothy was written to Timothy, the pastor of the church in Ephesus. Ephesus was known for its temple to Artem Artemis. Artemis. I'm not going to get in detail with Artemis. I'm going to talk a little bit about it. And women were the authority in that branch of paganism. Therefore, the theory goes, Paul was only reacting against the female lead customs of the Ephesians um, idolaters. Okay? And the church needed to be different. However, the book of 1 Timothy nowhere mentions Artemis. Okay, never, 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 never did mention that at all. Nor does Paul mention the standard practice of Artemis um, worshipers as a reason for restrictions of 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. So we're going to cross that out. A third objection is that Paul is only referring to husband and wives, not men and women in general. The Greek words for woman and man in 1 Timothy chapter 2 could refer to husband and wives. However, the basic meaning of the words is broader than that. Further, the same Greek words are used in verses 8 and 10 of this particular chapter are only husbands to lift up holy hands in prayer without anger and disputing, verse 8. Are only wives in dress are to dress modestly, have good deeds and worship God, verses 9 and 10. Of course not. Verses 8 and 10 clearly refer to all men and women, not just husband and wives. And there is nothing in the context that would indicate a, na a narrowing, narrowing to husbands and wives in verses 11 and 14. We're not talking about that. So that's out, right? Not just talking about, not talking about husband and wives. No, men and women. An objection to this interpretation of women in pastoral ministry re refer refer references uh, women in positions of leadership in the Bible, specifically Miriam. Here we go. Miriam, Deborah of the Old Testament, Miriam of the Old Testament, Deborah of the Old Testament, then Haldai or Haldai in the Old Testament. It is true that these women were chosen by God. They were for a special service to him and that they stand as models of faith, courage, and yes, leadership. However, 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 the authority of a woman in the Old Testament is not relevant to the issue of pastors in the church today. Again, those are totally different offices. The old, we cannot... <laughs> refer the Old Testament to the New Testament when we're talking about pastors and overseers. We're not talking about that. We can't bring Deborah into this. The New Testament epistles present a new uh, paradigm for God's people, the church, the body of Christ. And that paradigm involves an authority structure unique to the church, not for the nation of Israel or any other Old Testament ent entity. Not for that. Similar arguments are made using Priscilla and Phoebe. Remember, Phoebe was a deacon. She was a deacon in the New Testament. She was a deaconess. In Acts 18, Priscilla and Aquila are presented as faithful ministers for Christ. In verse 18, again, let me reiterate, Priscilla's name is mentioned first, suggesting to some that she was more prominent in ministry than her husband. The detail of those whose, whose name comes first is probably insequential. We don't really know, you know, because in verses 2 and 26, the order is reversed from that of verse 18. So that's not really saying that, that she was more prominent in her ministry than her husband. Did Priscilla and her husband teach the gospel of Jesus Christ to Apollos? Yes, they did. Remember, we talked about that. Yes, in Acts 18, they did. Yes, he, yes, they did. Yes, and in their home, they explained to him the way of God more adequately. Now, Acts 18, 26, if you want to look at that again, if you want to really look at it, read that whole chapter. Now, does the Bible, does the Bible ever say that Priscilla pastored a church or taught publicly or became the spiritual leader of a congregation of saints? No, it doesn't. She never did that. Priscilla never did that. No, it doesn't. No. As far as we know, Priscilla was not involved in ministry activity in contradiction to 
1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. In Romans 16 and 1, Phoebe is called a deacon or a servant because whenever you see that word deacon within the Bible, it is a masculine word. It is a masculine word in the Greek or in the Hebrew. And in the church, it, it is highly commended by Paul. But as with Priscilla, there is nothing in the scripture to indicate that Phoebe was a pastor or a teacher of men in the church. She was a deaconess or able to teach is given to as qualifications for elders, but not for deacons. First Timothy 3, 1 through 13 Titus chapter 1 verses 6 through 9. Titus chapter 1 verses 6 through 9. First Timothy chapter 3 verses 1 through 3. So the structure of First Timothy chapter 2, 11 through 14, which we are studying today, makes the reason why women cannot be pastors perfectly clear. Verse 13 begins with four, giving the cause of Paul's statement in verses 11 and 12. He finna, he finna go ahead and proceed um, with the statements he made in 11 and 12, why should women not teach or have authority over men? Because Adam was created first, then Eve. And Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived, right? Yes, it was. Verses 13 and 14. God created Adam first and then created Eve to be a helper for Adam. So a woman, your your destiny, your design, your whole design, your your whole your really your purpose as a woman is to be a helpmate. You were created to be a helpmate for your husband, a helpmate or meat. That's what is in the Bible, meat. But the order of creation has universal application in family. Ephesians chapter five, verses twenty-two through thirty-three, and in the church. So let's read that really quickly. Ephesians chapter five, verses twenty-two through um, thirty-three. But I'm going to read twenty-two through twenty-four. Now, if you want to read, it's very important that you do it. But read twenty-two through thirty-three. But <laughs> time has been far spent, so we're not going to do that. Um, Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 through 24. Here it is. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body and in himself its savior. Okay. 24th verse. Now, as the church submits to the Christ, so also... So as the church submit to Christ, so also should wives submit to everything to, to their husbands. Everything they submit to, to their husbands. Not some things, they say everything to their husbands. And I'm talking louder so my wife can hear. But that's a different story. But submit to everything that, that to their husbands. Now, the fact that Eve was deceived and also given as reason for a woman not serving as pastors or having spiritual authority over a man, 1 Timothy 2 and 14, this does not mean that women are gullible. Again, it does not mean that, that you are gullible, more gullible, that they are all more easily deceived than men. No, it's not saying that. If all women are more easily deceived, why would they be allowed to teach children, right? Who, who are easily deceived? And other women who are supposedly more easily deceived. That, so that's not true. That's not why. The text simply says that women are not to teach men or have spiritual authority over men because Eve was deceived. God has chosen to give men the primary teaching authority in the church. And that's what it is. Many women excel in gifts and hospitality, mercy, teaching, evangelism, helping, serving, on and on. You all have great roles within the church. I mean, great God wants to use you in so many ways instead of the role of authority within the church. But you otherwise you can be used in various ways. I'm telling you, you can be, but not just not that role of authority. Much of the ministry of the local church depends on, on women, right? Women in the church are not restricted from public praying or prophesying. Majority in the church are women today. And so we must receive, we must look at that. First Corinthians 11 and five talks about that, praying or prophesying, which I talked about earlier, only from having spiritual teaching authority over man, but they can pray and they can prophesy. Yes, they can. First Corinthians 11 and five. The Bible nowhere restricts women from exercising the gifts of the Holy Spirit. First Corinthians 12, read all of that chapter. Women, just as much as men, are called to minister to others, to demonstrate the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5, 22 through 23. And to proclaim the gospel to the lost. Matthew 28, uh, verses 18 through 20. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. 
So God has ordained that only men are to serve in positions of spiritual teaching authority in the church. This does not imply men are better teachers. It does not mean that. I talked about that earlier. It does not mean that or that women are inferior or less intelligent. I'm not saying that. We know that there are a lot of women smarter than men. We know that. We got that. We understand that. But that's not the premise. That's not what we're talking about. It is simply the way God designed the church to function. The woman is the weaker vessel. This is the way God set it up. This is the way God set it up. This is the role. Men are to set the example in spiritual leadership in their lives and through their words. Women are also to set an example in their lives, but in a different way. First Peter chapter three, verses one through six. Women are encouraged to teach other women. And that's Titus chapter two, verses three through five. That's when he tells the older women to teach the younger women how to love their husbands, on and on, on and on. Teach them how to be women, women of God. And the Bible also does not restrict women from teaching children. It does not. No, the only activity women are restricted from is having that spiritual authority over men, over men, having that spiritual authority over men. Very important. This bars women from serving as pastors to men. You cannot be a pastor of a church if you're a woman and you have men in your fellowship, men within your congregation. You cannot be a woman pastor. No, that is going against the word of God. Word of God never gives us anything like that as an overseer, a woman being an overseer over men. No, 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 it does not. And we must stop that today. You must stop that. You must really pray and let that go and really let God, let God, God's holy word, his spoken word, his spoken word, take control of your life. So this does not make women less important. It does not. No, you are very important. You're very vital to the church today. Very vital by any means. Rather, it gives them a ministry focus more in agreement with God's design. This is God's design. You cannot change God's design. So many people want to change God's design. And we can get into trans, transgenderism and on and on. But so many people want to change God's design. Men and men, um, same-sex marriage. Oh, no, that's not God's design. So is a woman being a pastor. It's not God's design. It's not, not God's design. It's not, no. Not if a woman, not if a man is, is in a congregation. No, it's not. So it's ordained by God, from God, to us, to the church, that a man, be the pastor in the headship of that church and at home. Okay. So we have to realize that and really receive that word from God, really receive that word and take in that word and take heed of that word that men are the headship of their church and their home. So I pray that you receive that word. I pray that you really um, just let it seek in and let it manifest in your mind that um, the word of God is God's spoken word. This is God's spoken word. God's spoken word is very important. Everything in this word, God breathed out. He breathed out and this is his word. There's no contradictions within his word. The word does not contradict. And we, we went scripture by scripture, scripture by scripture. And we let scripture interpret scripture here at True Vine. And I pray that you learn. I pray that you receive the word of God. God bless you. Remember to check the description down below. In our description, you, um, you'll find um, the, the address. If you want to become a member to this church, please, please, please just submit it in the email. And if you want to come fellowship with us, our address is there. If you want to send some funds, we have all types of ways within our description where you can send monies to us. Um, please do. God bless you. We love you so much. And we're praying for you here at True Vine. And you want to know why? Because we're True Vine and we are the church of love. God bless. Thank you so much for watching. Be sure to subscribe to this channel and join our online Christian family. Tithes, offerings, and donations can be made via Cash App at dollar sign tvmbc or by mail at true vine missionary baptist church 1407 grove street houston texas 77020 thank you so much and have a blessed day